Hello everyone, uh, my name is Lucy Campbell um, and I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the London Borough of Camden, the University of York and Fulfilling Lives in Islington and Camden uh, to the launch of our research into women's hidden homelessness and the need to improve strategy, data and outcomes. So we're launching this report as part of the 16 Days of Activism Against Gender-Based Violence 2021 uh, for a reason, and that is that we know uh, for almost all women, homelessness is not experienced as a need in and of itself, um, and women's experiences of homelessness are almost universally tied up with links to domestic abuse and other forms of gender-based violence. So the 16 Days of activis Activism every year are a time for us to reflect and raise awareness about violence against women, uh, but more than that, they really are a call to action, and that is really a key theme for our event today. Uh, we really hope this research can be a catalyst for change um, in how do we respond to women's homelessness at both a service and a system level. So moving on to our agenda, um, we have a really jam-packed agenda for you today. Uh, if you can move slides, please. So just a little bit of kind of uh, Zoom um, uh, information first. So we are going to be using a webinar format today, uh, which means that we can't see you. Um, just to also mention, we've had over 370 RSVPs for today, which is um, absolutely brilliant. So thank you so much for joining us to uh, shine a light on this really important issue and join the discussion today. Um, so yeah, we can't see you, um, but please, if you'd like to introduce yourself um, using the chat box so we know who's in the room, uh, that'd be brilliant to use that. Uh, we've also got the question box as well, so you can ask questions um, in real time as we're going through the presentations today. Uh, we are going to be leaving 15 minutes at the end of the event uh, for you to ask the panellists today um, any questions that you might have, uh, either about this research specifically or about women's homelessness in general. Um, and also, if you see someone else put a question in the box that you'd really like answered as well, if you just give it a thumbs up or if you upvote it, then it will go to the top of the list and we can answer that at the end of the session. Okay, so before I hand over to uh, Manaxi Patel, Camden Strategy and Commissioning uh, Manager, um, I'd like to just kind of um, briefly touch on the reason why we situated uh, this research within the London Borough of Camden. Um, so really the fact that we only did this research in Camden was uh, purely a matter of kind of capacity and resource. Um, it would have been really brilliant actually if we were able to uh, do this research more widely across London, um, kind of get a wider picture of women's homelessness across Greater London. Um, however, something which the report um, touches on a number of times um, that is that it's very unlikely that the findings of this research um, are specific to the borough of Camden. Uh, and what's more likely is that the findings of this research really do speak to a much wider picture around women's homelessness um, across Greater London and um, if not nationally as well. So whether you're joining us today from Camden or further afield, um, I think the messages of today are really applicable to all of us as we think about women's homelessness. Um, we've been really lucky actually to be conducting this research in Camden and to have the support of Camden Council uh, to look at women's homelessness um, and start to think about how we can develop an integrated strategy uh, to respond better. So to talk a little bit more about the Camden perspective, um, I'd now like to hand over to Manaxi Patel, the Strategy and Commissioning Manager for Camden. Thanks very much, Manaxi. Just, okay, there we are. Uh, can you hear me okay? Hi there, everyone. Um, it's really lovely to be at this event. It's a real pleasure uh, for me to be part of it. Um, Camden really values highly the work that Flick has done in the borough over the last seven years. Um, and we were really supportive of the research that's been carried out. Um, I want to give a bit of background, a broad context to homelessness in the borough of Camden to give a better understanding of the research findings. So Camden has the extremes of uh, deprivation and wealth. In some areas of the borough, we have levels of deprivation that are within the top 10 to 20 percent in the UK. And we know that in areas of deprivation, there are higher rates, uh, diagnosis rates and death rates than in less deprived areas. Camden's also in the top five boroughs in the country impacted by rough sleeping, and it's second to Westminster in London. Um, we see between 600 to 800 rough sleepers in the borough every year, half of whom are new to rough sleeping, 
and six, about 60% are non-UK nationals with very limited access to public funds. And only one in six has a local connection. Um, public health estimate that Camden has some of the highest numbers of homeless people with multiple disadvantage. And we can point to a number of reasons. I'm not going to go into them, but they include, you know, a decade of austerity, the housing crisis, and now the pandemic. So um, Camden's strategy to homelessness and rough sleeping is based on prevention. Um, wherever possible, we, we support people to find alternative accommodation or, or reconnection, or, or if they're vulnerable, uh, will provide supported accommodation. That puts a per person on a journey towards independent living. And generally, Camden has tried to respond to the pressures around uh, finances, et cetera, uh, by trying to maintain the investment in services uh, for homeless people. And particularly with regards to single homelessness, we have been able to maintain our supported accommodation provision, which we call the adult pathway. Um, it's not perfect, but it does provide supported accommodation for 650 people in the borough. It's the largest provision in London, and some of that provision is being tailored to better support the needs of homeless women. For the past five years, we've been working towards making all our supported accommodation provision uh, psychologically informed and trauma informed. And through the work of Safe Space, which you'll hear about uh, a bit more later, and the work of Flick, we've been increasing our understanding of multiple disadvantage and women's homelessness, and how those needs can be better met uh, within supported accommodation. We've also been really fortunate with funding applications, which have enabled us to have a housing first service, which is one of the largest in the country, with a dedicated provision for women. And more recently, we've been able to open a 15 bed respite centre for homeless women who are at risk of uh, domestic violence, coercion and harassment from street based activity. And through a small reconfiguration of our supported accommodation, we'll be providing a 22 bed uh, hostel for women with multiple disadvantage from April. So. Um, I also want to um, give a bit of um, to say something about how we reacted to the pandemic, because I think it's relevant uh, as well to the situation in Camden. And a real benefit of our response was um, a coming together strategically of health, public health and housing over the uh, issue of homelessness. And what we saw was a real focusing of minds and services. And uh, we saw that services could work differently and definitely more flexibly. So prior to the pandemic, we were already thinking about a more integrated way of working with rust sleepers. Um, but the Everyone In initiative allowed us to test a model, a multidisciplinary way of working, which demonstrated uh, positive outcomes over a really short period of time. So it spurred us on um, to develop a multidisciplinary team approach um, within our supported accommodation that's going to be based around physical health. And Camden's also made a commitment to a wider ambition of system change and work, working towards a more integrated response to homelessness from all uh, services in Camden. And we're currently advertising for a head of homelessness system transformation. So there's real momentum and commitment for system change and the ambition we're moving towards is something that we're calling our house and it acknowledges that um, homelessness and rough sleeping is not just a housing issue and that what, what we really need is all services working together towards a whole person approach if we're going to tackle chronic homelessness and the aim is to put the homeless person at the centre in the right accommodation um, as a foundation to everything then we, that we do, and then sort of build up services around the individual. And as well as thinking about housing, we're thinking about health, social care, employment, training, et cetera. So we're trying to take the adult social care, safeguarding every matters approach um, to homelessness. So it doesn't matter who the homeless person comes in contact with, they'll get a consistent approach from services 
and that approach needs to be uh, trauma informed it needs to be flexible all the things that we know works better with for homeless people and embedded within that needs to be approaches to working with homeless women as well as uh, co-production being at the heart um, of everything that we do so I think there are elements of that ambition in some of the things that we do within Camden, but obviously there's a lot more that we do need to do. And we need to embed that vision of an integrated approach to homelessness across all services, both internal and external to the council. So we'll be using the findings from the research to inform our own uh, commissioning strategy uh, for supported accommodation for the next three years. And we'll also be using the research to inform our homelessness system transformation programme going forward. So, um, yeah, that's, that's what I'd like to say about Camden. I'd like to hand back now to uh, Lucy uh, Campbell from Flick. Thank you very much for that, Manaxi. So I'm now just going to talk briefly um, about why we knew this research needed to be commissioned um, from the perspective of our, of our frontline work within Flick. Um, so our programme for filling lives in Islington and Camden, or Flick as it's known, um, has been running in Islington and Camden since 2014. Uh, we were one of 12 areas commissioned nationally by the Big Lottery Fund uh, to support people experiencing multiple disadvantages in four key areas, uh, which are homelessness, uh, mental ill health, offending behaviour and substance misuse. So when our project was first starting out in 2014-2015, uh, Lankley Chase's Hard Edges report told us um, that eight out of ten people who are experiencing severe and multiple disadvantages uh, were men, so a really small proportion of those experiencing multiple disadvantage were seen to be women. Um, and also rough sleeping statistics, both back in 2014 um, and right up till now, um, have always said that women make up around 15% uh, of the rough sleeping population. And, and that statistic is pretty, um, pretty much the same in Greater London, across Greater London and beyond. Um, so therefore, kind of given those statistics, uh, we found it quite surprising that in the first six months um, of opening our doors, uh, that women made up almost 50% of our caseload. That was a lot higher than perhaps we expected. Um, so 100% of the women that we support um, had homelessness as a primary issue at the point that they were referred to us. Um, and when we looked at that homelessness a little bit more closely, something that we realised was that um, around 50% of those women uh, were not verified by CHAIN. So for anyone who's not familiar with CHAIN, uh, it is a, a multi-agency database uh, which holds information on anyone who rough sleeps um, across Greater London. So any outreach team or hostel accommodation uh, can input that they've had contact uh, with someone who's previously rough slept onto that. And people are also verified as sleeping on the streets. So only around 50% of our women were on this database. Um, and something else uh, that we noticed when we looked at this more closely was that even for those women who, who were on chain, uh, many of them had um, been seen kind of very, very infrequently, um, their visibility um, and therefore their kind of in interaction and engagement with homelessness services uh, was often very, very low. Um, so, for example, one woman that we work with that springs to mind, um, Dee, uh, so when we started supporting her, um, she, she'd been verified on chain 17 years previously. Um, and then when we looked at her record over that 17 years, she'd only come into contact with homelessness services uh, on three occasions, um, despite the fact that we know that she was homeless uh, throughout that entire period. So it was something that we wanted to look at more closely and try and understand uh, why this was happening. Um, and something else which really stood out to us was that when we started working uh, in Islington and Camden, we really opened our doors really widely uh, to accept referrals from everywhere and anywhere that was uh, coming into contact with people that needed our support. Um, so, you know, we reached out to uh, police, probation, GP surgeries, uh, substance misuse services, domestic abuse services. Um, we really kind of invited referrals from any agency um, across the two boroughs. And what that meant for us, um, which was actually really, really positive, was that we we're able to uh, find women who may have been homeless for a really, really long time, uh, but who hadn't necessarily been coming to the attention of homelessness services, uh, though they were kind of popping up elsewhere across the system. So again, that approach was something which worked really well in terms of um, getting that kind of higher level of caseload of women, although we knew uh, that there was probably you know, many, many more women out there that we weren't able to reach. So that was the kind of basis of wanting to look at this issue more closely. Uh, if we can move slides, please. 
Um, so another issue which we kind of maybe uh, not geared up to deal with within Flick and maybe not expecting uh, was the really, really high levels of violence and abuse that um, the women that we were supporting uh, were experiencing. Uh, so as it says here, over 90% of the women that we work with um, have either experienced domestic abuse and or other forms of gender based violence uh, whilst working with us or have disclosed to us that they were previously experiencing these forms of violence. So, you know, a really, really shockingly high number. Uh, and to add to that, uh, none of these women um, at the point that they started working with us were receiving specialist support um, around violence and abuse. So, again, that kind of led us really to question uh, why it was that women who were homeless and experiencing other forms of disadvantage uh, were maybe less able to receive support around domestic violence and abuse. It's something that we wanted to focus in on. Um, and again, a another thing which we were uh, noticing was just kind of the levels of violence and the levels of risk which women were um, were, were experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. So 70% of the women that we support um, have been subject to safeguarding referrals and or MARIC referrals um, since starting work with us. And for many of those women, that's been kind of referrals repeated times uh, due to ongoing risks. Um, and finally, we also found ourselves really, really challenged when trying to support women who are homeless um, by the fact that often the women would be homeless with their perpetrators. Um, so that could be that they might be rough sleeping on the streets with perpetrators present, or it may be that they were um, in unsafe accommodation with perpetrators there. Um, and another issue that we were facing was that women would often abandon accommodation like hostel accommodation uh, due to coercive control from the perpetrators, or it may be that due to antisocial behaviour associated with their perpetrators, they'd often be evicted from projects as well. So the interconnected experiences of homelessness and domestic abuse um, really, really needed more of a focus. And we really wanted to commission a piece of research which could explore this in more depth, um, but also more importantly, start to give us some recommendations of how we could um, respond better and, and support women better, really. I think as well, um, you know, we've talked um, uh, about some of the statistics involved um, in kind of bringing together this research and why we wanted to look at these issues more closely. But I think kind of the most compelling reason we wanted to look at this um, issue um, within the research was just from speaking uh, to the women that we support and hearing their stories um, and their experiences. Um, so I've been working with Flick since it started seven and a half years ago, and you know there are too many stories to, to recount today, but I'm just going to pull out a couple really quickly uh, to give you an overview of those experiences. So um, one woman, uh, Sadie, for example, um, so she became homeless um, due to experiencing um, horrific um, sexual and physical violence from her then partner. Um, and when we started supporting her back in 2015, um, she had been homeless um, and experiencing complex post-traumatic stress disorder for a period of seven years without coming to the attention of services. So by herself, kind of getting worse and worse, and more unwell uh, by the time she, she came to us. Um, or another woman, Michaela, um, whose children were aged four and seven when they were removed from her care by social services. So for Michaela, um, that happened because uh, the police had attended the family home to arrest her abusive partner on a non-related offence. Um, and when they attended, they found um, his class A drugs in the family home, so they removed the children. Um, she was shortly after evicted from her home and she recalls um, being given half an hour to pack a bag of clothes from the family home and, and leave. Um, and then she herself had been a care leaver, so she didn't have any support network. She didn't have any family to help her get back on her feet, uh, to rebuild her life or to try and regain custody of her children. Um, so she reports just being completely lost and alone and sleeping in parks and woodlands for up to two years uh, without kind of knowing what to do or where to turn. By the time that she realised that what she needed to do um, was sleep, uh, rough sleep visibly in order to get support, uh, she then spent six months rough sleeping on Tottenham Court Road. By that time, um, she was heavily involved in drug and alcohol use. Uh, her mental health had really deteriorated. And by that point that she kind of came into services, um, she had no chance of regaining custody of her children. So a lifelong trauma um, that she'll be living uh, due to those circumstances that led to her homelessness. So... I think something to reflect on is that these stories uh, are not particularly extreme or they're not rare uh, for, for this group of women. In fact, they are really shockingly common. Um, I'd like to now just play a short film of some of the women that we support talking about their experiences of surviving uh, long term and repeated homelessness. I 
sense of homelessness is not having it easy. Like, it can be from broken families or, like, you know, addiction. You know, like spending out your rent money and everything. But homelessness is that when you reach the bottom, basically, and it's for you to find your way back up. Mm. I've been homeless, like, on and off since I was 16. I was homeless in Glasgow and then came back down to London and I was homeless on and off, like, hostels, the street, uh, refugees and upon having to move because my ex-partners found out where I was. And... I'm still living out of bags now. I'm still living out of bags. I've always lived out of bags. You know, they're easy to pick up and go, aren't they? Do you know what I mean? It's horrible. It's horrible. Not feeling secure. Oh, it's horrible. I'm feeling it now as I'm talking about it. I'm feeling it, you know? Ooh. My experience of being homeless was being out on the street for days, sleeping in dustbins, around the back of dustbins and, and in people's doorways and wondering where your next meal's coming from. And it, it, it was a horrible experience. I was hidden away a lot, walking around all night, going on buses, fucking sleeping in hospitals, drinking day and night, drinking strong, strong, strong beers just to get through the night and just sleep. But that's when I found people who were homeless at first. I had no one, so I slept in woods on my own, everywhere that you could name. Going for buses back and forth all night. And the bus men were so nice then, you know? So nice. Not necessarily only on the streets, cos, like, you've got sofa surfing, you've got people that used to sleep in block of flats and everything, but if you want to see them, do something about it in the daytime so these people can see it, so at night time it's not a nightmare. Near the end of my homelessness, I got more help then than I did at the start. At the start, like, it was really hard, like, there was no way off. Cos, like, I think it's cos I was underage as well. Like under 25, there wasn't a lot of places to go. Like sometimes I'd have to like get someone to tell me where to go or like outreach your face on me on, on the streets. They would say, oh, this place is open this morning and you can go there or like I'd never know where to go unless I got told. I find that the difference between a woman being homeless is that hygiene is key importantness, you know, in that periods and being emotional and everything. Also, the vulnerability is, like, sky high. Women are more vulnerable when they're homeless because, like, men play on them. If they see you on your own, they'll be like, come back to me, I'll show up. And then they'll go, well, you've got a boyfriend, you can come back to mine and I'll give you money or whatever. I had to live in places, dodgy places. And I used to wake up and there used to be a man standing, staring at me. And I've had men laying on top of me at Christmas Day, do you know what I mean? I've had other things happen. There's been times, even myself, that men try to take advantage of that by saying, oh, you have nowhere to go, OK, then come back with me. And because you're desperate and you're hungry and everything, you're going to at least risk it. And that was a real risk because, like, some women end up getting raped or brainwashed into selling their bodies and everything or even fed through drugs. Oh, the support I did get was was good because I had the drop-in centre where I could go to be myself and do activities and that would keep me off the streets for the day or so. And then that gives you an initiative to want to do better in yourself, to stay off the street. That's why I got my new chair. So I ain't going to move from it. <laughs> my experience with Housing First has been absolutely tremendous. Yeah? Because, like, they listen to you, you know? The first thing, which is, like, the main thing, is to make sure that you're safe and housed, yeah? Then they help you if you have money issues or with budgeting and everything like that, you know? Um, literally, like, 179%. Do you know what I mean? Top notch, yeah? Look at me now.
Thank you so much to the women who contributed to that amazing film um, for sharing their experiences with us. Okay, so I'm just going to very briefly touch on um, why women's homelessness has been neglected. So uh, Dr. Joanne Bretherton and Professor Nicholas Peace, the authors of this report, uh, will be talking about this um, a bit more. Um, but just to pre briefly touch on um, three ways uh, which the report highlights that women's homelessness has come to be um, underrepresented and or overlooked. So firstly, uh, the idea of spatial error. So um, this involves the definitions of homelessness uh, being really, really narrow. So looking, for example, uh, rough sleeping or the numbers of people who access emergency uh, homelessness shelters. Uh, and we know we've just heard from the women in that film uh, the women tend to avoid those, uh, those environments for reasons of personal safety. So they're not counted in those spaces. Uh, secondly, administrative error. So this involves only counting women's homelessness uh, under certain circumstances and within certain systems. So uh, something I didn't know until this research was that, for example, women who are living in domestic abuse refuges uh, are not recorded as homeless, um, even though they absolutely are. Uh, so that's uh, another form of error which has led to this kind of underrepresentation. Um, and thirdly, the idea of methodological error. So this is around how uh, homelessness is researched. Um, so we know that uh, you know we, we have a really big focus on rough sleeping in England, uh, and rough sleeping uh, is researched using uh, short periods of kind of snapshot data collection, uh, street counts. So that's the outreach team going out on designated nights uh, and counting everyone that they can see rough sleeping in, in the borough on any given night. Um, and again, we know that those processes are always going to oversample men uh, because women are far, far more likely to be to be hidden away and concealed and not visibly rough sleeping when that data is collected. Um, and hidden homelessness or concealed homelessness uh, currently is, is not explored. There isn't a way to uh, quantify um, how, how that's being experienced by women. So if we can move on to the next slide, please. Something else that the report um, uh, touches on is the idea that hidden homelessness um, itself as a concept um, is actually potentially quite, um, quite damaging because it maybe implies that hidden homelessness is maybe less dangerous or less severe than other forms of homelessness, for example, rough sleeping, uh, because of this idea that it occurs you know, within housing under a roof. Um, however, I think it's really, really important to point out that in reality, a woman who is hidden homeless or who is safer surfing has... Uh, no physical control over the space that she occupies. Um, she will most likely lack privacy as a result. She's very likely to be unsafe as a result. She has no legal rights, so she can simply be asked to leave at any time or day or night. Um, likely to be living in overcrowded and or physically unfit spaces. And also she may lack access to basic utilities such as bathrooms and kitchens. So, you know, as we heard from the women in the film just now, um, hidden homelessness is, is anything uh, but a safe option. Uh, you know, the women were talking about then uh, waking up in squats with men standing over them uh, while they slept um, and also being on the street and having to make the choice every night of whether they'd uh, risk staying out on the street and being exposed or going home with um, strangers and risking sexual violence. You know, horrific choices for women have to have to be made uh, around their safety on a kind of night by night basis. Um, and what kind of compounds that risk um, is, is the very hidden nature of these experiences, the fact that when women are in those flats or in these kind of um, quieter locations, they're not going to be found by outreach teams, they're not going to come into support, and so their experiences uh, will go on for much longer uh, and become much worse. So I'd now like to hand over to uh, Dr Joanne Brotherton and Professor Nicholas Pleece, uh, who um, are from the University of York, and other authors of this brilliant report. So thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Um, hello, everyone. It's great to have so many of you um, here for the launch of, of this piece of work. Um, I'd like to start, start by thanking Fulfilling Lives, um, Lucy in particular for, for coming to Nicholas and I back in the summer of, of 2019 to discuss the possibilities around this piece of work. Um, and thinking about what we could do. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with the team and, and we couldn't have done this without the huge amount of support from the borough and agencies and services in and around Camden. Um, so I'll present the background to the research um, and what we did methodologically. And then Nicholas will take over to discuss the findings from the survey, the longitudinal data and interviews. And then I'll pop back in to look at feedback from stakeholders and and I suppose discuss the implications of all this. Um, 
As is always the case with this kind of webinar format, we have a very short time to, to present um, a considerable amount of research. So do please forgive us for, for flying through slides. Okay, so, so the background to the research. So the Centre for Housing Policy at York, um, working with Filling Lives and Camden SHP and, and, and the borough, and as I said, other partner agencies across Camden, um, we were commissioned to explore ways in which the strategic response to women's homelessness in Camden could be, could be enhanced. The research focused on lone women experiencing homelessness, as we know that data are better de developed on, on family homelessness. And lone women can be living rough, but are more likely to be living in, in homelessness services, emergency and temporary accommodation, and particularly to be experiencing hidden or concealed homelessness, which Lucy has just touched upon. Um, so staying in insecure, precarious arrangements with relatives, acquaintances, because they have nowhere else to go. So just as the video that we just saw highlighted, it's that prolonged and, and recurrent instability. Okay, next slide. So historically, uh, political and media narratives tend to equate homelessness with rough sleeping, rather than acknowledge the true scale of homelessness. Um, for example, by focusing on reducing rough sleep accounts while not drawing attention to the scale of of what is highly gendered family homelessness. Hidden or concealed homelessness has also not been explored um, in part because people in these situations are, are nom nominally accommodated in housing. Now, the realities are that women experiencing homelessness can have little or no privacy. And again, as Lucy's just mentioned, physical safety or security of tenure and are often in highly unsuitable environments. Lone women and women with children who react to homelessness by using precarious arrangements with friends, family, again, staying because, with them because there is nowhere else to go, are extremely difficult to count. And these difficulties in counting homeless women have led to this misconception that numbers are, are much lower than they actually are. So again, Lucy mentioned this very briefly, there, there are intersecting enumeration errors, um, and these center on spatial administrative and methodological flaws. And this is from a piece of work that uh, myself and my colleague Paula Mayock did for Fianza earlier this year. So the issues are uh, women, including women with high and complex needs, uh, may often not be in recognized homelessness spaces, such as shelters and, and hostels. Women's homelessness may not be counted as such by administrative systems. So for example, family homelessness and categories which also uh, categorize homelessness as, as domestic abuse and not homelessness also. Women conceal themselves for safety reasons. Um, so methods like street counts cannot easily find them. And, and Nicholas and I found that, that in a piece of work that we did for St. Mungo's a few years ago. Um, women experiencing hidden homelessness are difficult to count if they're not in contact with services and systems, of course, that, that record their homelessness. So, so these are issues that we know are present in the counting of, of women and, and thus our understanding of women's homelessness. So, in terms of the research, what we did, so the idea um, was that we wanted to design something that could, that could build this better understanding of the situation for women in Camden. And we wanted to, very importantly, draw on the experience of women who were homeless and, and also those that were working to support them. So it was a mixed method study um, and there were four elements. So we did an anonymized short cross-sectional survey that took place on the 28th of July this year. And this took place in, in and around homelessness services um, within Camden and volunteers from the staff teams in those services um, collected the data on our behalf. Um, uh, we did a tracking, tracking exercise using anonymized um, data of, of women's service use longitudinally and data was based on 59 women from across Camden services. And we also did semi-structured interviews with, with currently homeless women. And we also did a range of interviews with key um, partners and stakeholders in policy and practice in Camden. Um, now this of course took place during, during COVID and a couple of, and, and actually over a couple of the, the COVID lockdowns. And it meant that unfortunately we had to work at a distance which is far from ideal and certainly not what we had in mind during the planning stages. So it did mean that we had to rely an awful lot on the generosity of services in Camden during what was a very difficult period and, and still is for them also. Um, the most difficult aspect in terms of the research methodology was the interviews with currently homeless women. I had to do this from home, like now, um, 
So I was talking to women who were often walking around the streets of Camden on the telephone. Um, and this would have been absolutely impossible without the help from the services who, who helped to orchestrate all this. But what it did mean, unfortunately, is that despite our best efforts, we weren't able to speak to as many women directly as, as we had planned. So in terms of the goals of the research, so we wanted to draw on existing and, and largely unexploited data sources um, across multiple sectors in Camden to develop a more accurate picture. We wanted to enhance the understanding of the lived experience of homeless women. And we then used this analysis to develop an integrated cross-sector pathway that we, we, we hope will enhance the effectiveness of service responses to women's homelessness across Camden. And we did this with a view to, to possibly creating a replicable strategic response that could be used in, in other areas of the UK. Okay, I'll hand over to Nicholas, who will talk about the, the main findings. Hello. So, the focus of the research was really on women who are more likely to have high and complex needs, which is the focus of, of Flick. I'm sorry, there's a strange noise happening behind me. Let's stop now. Um, so alongside the interviews with women with lived experience of homelessness, as Joe just said, we conducted a survey of 134 women, and we also looked at fully anonymized data on the trajectories of 59 women through the pattern of services and the contact with services that they'd had backtracking from the middle of 2021. The key messages of really quite powerful for this piece of research. So there's very clear evidence of a group of women with very high and complex, complex needs who are within patterns of sustained and recurrent homelessness, who are caught in a revolving door of, of service issues where they're constantly in contact with various services, but their underlying need around homelessness has not necessarily been addressed during all the contact with their service, those services. And this homelessness, this repeat and, and long term homelessness associated with very high and complex needs is happening in a London borough with highly developed homelessness services comparatively. So Camden's a housing first pioneer. It's a London borough that's got an effective pathway using a mix of outreach supported housing and other support. So even in a context where homelessness services are comparatively developed, there's still the presence of this group with women with very high and complex needs in this loop of recurrent and sustained homelessness. Within that, the experience of domestic and other forms of abuse is extremely high. Really, one could say it's, it's a near universal experience uh, 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 among the women. This research, other research that, that Joanne's done and that other colleagues have done around women's homelessness, again, suggests that while the needs of men who are caught in a situation of recurrent and long-term home, uh, uh, long homelessness can be very high, for women, those needs can be still higher. So one of the graphics of the report this is from the survey data, and it shows very high rates of repeat homelessness. So half the women reported being homeless more than three times. A quarter of them reported being homeless twice or three times. So very high rates of repeat homelessness amongst this group. And again, this goes back to this revolving door experience recurrent and sustained homelessness associated with very high and complex needs. Another quick one from, another quick slide from the, from the survey. The summary here is the women were reporting very poor health, 41%. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's all right, I'll go, I'll, I'll go on to the next one, but very poor health overall. Looking at the anonymized data, so just a quick overview of what we had in the anonymized data. So we had data, an average amount of data for about seven years of women's lives, about 85 months, and a median amount um, of about six years, about 73 months. 
on average, women had moved just under five times during that period for which the data was available for them. Sometimes that was from settled addresses to homelessness back into settled addresses again. Sometimes it was women going from one homeless service to another over the period. And it also included periods of, of living rough and sofa surfing. We did, for a smaller group of women, have very long-term data. So we had um, nine women on whom we had more than nine years of anonymized data about where they'd been living and what their experience of homelessness had been. Really, the pattern of repeat and sustained homelessness I was talking about just now was brought home by the 59 women on whom we had this anonymized data. So this is just the frequency with which they'd experience different kinds of accommodation. And the kinds of accommodation, the living situations they were most likely to have experienced in terms of the frequency of, of where they'd lived over that time, the greatest single thing was supported housing. So out of all the accommodation forms, the, ones, the one that they'd experienced most often as a group was homeless hostels, temporary supported housing, other forms of homelessness service. The second most common, the second most frequent form of living situation that they'd experienced was sofa surfing and living rough. And then was also temporary accommodation and a load of other things. So what we've done in the report is we've tried to illustrate some of the points coming out of the survey and some of the points coming out of the um, anonymized data through quotes with the women. And this is a woman talking about the experience of this kind of recurrent and sustained homelessness, this revolving door situation. She's talking here about asking somebody to sleep on the sofa and then feeling uncomfortable about being in the position where you're having to ask somebody that, starting to feel unwelcome, feeling that you need to move on. Eventually, in this instance, getting to the point where she was most comfortable getting herself a tent because she didn't have this sense of, of pressure and this sense of, of not being welcome, being a burden on somebody. It was psychologically easier for her to um, effectively live rough in a tent rather than be in this position of continually having to rely on other people because there was nowhere else to go. So again, going back to the anonymized data, summarizing that point in the graph about women had spent about 40 percent of their time in supported housing they'd spent about 20 percent of their time mainly sofa surfing but also living rough and what that meant was just to reinforce the point again for most of the time in which we had data available for these 59 women they were most likely to be either in supported housing and next most likely to be sofa surfing and living rough From the anonymized data, we had records from some of the service providers. We didn't have anything identifying the women in any way, but we did have whether or not the service providers had, had flagged particular issues around abuse. The service providers were reporting half the women were at risk of sexual exploitation, that half of them reported an experience of sexual violence and rape. Again, service provider judgment that three quarters of them nearly were at risk of violence and three quarters of them were reported to have experienced a traumatic event. And this is what the service providers were recording, what the women had shared with them, but very, very high rates of abuse being reported. And again, when we did the interviews with women, we talked about the experience of abuse, where they were prepared to share that with us. Well, first woman here, she's talking about why women prefer women only services. And it's because they've been in situations that have been abusive, domestic violence, domestic abuse. And it makes them apprehensive about situations where there are a lot of men or mixing with men. And you can see how, you know, a, a hostel or supported housing surface that's got significant numbers of male residents or even just a day centre that's got a lot of men in it might be an environment in which women don't feel safe. 
and then the experience of abuse is something that doesn't necessarily go away when homelessness happens that the former partner the abusive person is still there and um that sometimes women's pathways through and out of homelessness are being continually disrupted by the presence of an ex-partner or somebody else that's being abusive that their trajectory out of homeless some homelessness some of the reason why they're unable to exit from homelessness more quickly is the behavior of abusive men and that's it for me Okay, um, thanks, Nicholas. So I'd like to um, come back and talk a little bit about um, some of the feedback that we got from organisations and, and agencies um, in the sector um, in and around Camden. Um, now, obviously, we had much more input from stakeholders than the next couple of slides would suggest, but I just simply don't have time to, to include it all here. So what I will give is sort of the main points that came across to us and the rest of it and the detail obviously is, is in the report. So the stakeholders reported a very similar picture of women's needs um, and experiences to, to what we found from our own survey, the longitudinal tracking data that Nicholas has just presented and also the interviews with women. Um, the borough, it was felt had relatively extensive and well-organized homelessness services, um, but however, the reports that resourcing was a challenge both in respect of whether there were sufficient services and also how quickly the services were able to respond um, so the quotes the two quotes here illustrate that quite well um, so impressive comparatively in terms of the, the services that were available but the frustrations began when um, the speed at which something could be orchestrated or execu executed was quite slow um, in terms of gaps in services, um, this was reported at, at two levels really across the board. Um, there was thought to be a need for more women only services, which I hear time and time again, um, and specifically services run for women by women. The second point around gaps was that there were reports of shortfalls in, in women only spaces in some fixed site services. So for example, hostel, hostel supported housing, shelters, and a result of this was that there was greater instability of women for women who lost those places in fixed site services um, as beds were scarcer. So if a woman lost a place, she would find it more difficult than, than, than a man to find another place because they, those places just didn't exist. Um, and again, the quote illustrates that, that quite clearly about the challenges um, because sometimes the, the majority of women would prefer a women's only space and, and there was just nowhere to, to refer them on to. Um, another point that came across from, from a range of the, the organisations that we spoke to was around the differential nature of services. And I found this in other research that I've done, whereby um, depending on whether or not a woman has a dependent child or children in their care has is something that, that was regarded by stakeholders as, a, as an issue. And, and as I said, other research has shown that um, more quite comprehensive, immediate and sometimes better quality support is given to a lone woman parent with a child. Um, and again, the, the quote here illustrates that quite, quite starkly um, in terms of a, a woman that was, that was pregnant um, within the service and what happens postpartum. Um, so again, the child was protected and, and was emphasized, but the systems to protect what could be a, a, a woman with very high support needs was, was not as well developed. Um, okay. The stakeholders reported that in integration of domestic abuse and homelessness services could be more effective. Um, and that's something that needs to be considered in developing any kind of strategy moving forward. Um, an array of services were required by women experiencing homelessness, particularly those experiencing long-term and repeated homelessness. Um, the problem is that the services were separate, separately commissioned often, so therefore separately administered and operating in different ways. And this, there was not that uh, sort of coordinated integrated package of support that, that would reflect the findings and, and the intersectional nature of, of women's needs. Stakeholders identified the usual problems with, with housing. Um, of course, goes beyond Camden, um, a lack of affordable adequate supply in London, highlighting the shortage of, of affordable homes, 
um, which meant that it was effectively unavailable to, to most women that were experiencing homelessness. So taking all this into account, what could a strategy for Camden look like? Um, now, of course, as I say on the slide here, the specifics of a strategy for Camden are a matter for the local authority and for partner agencies, but we can provide a, a broad illustration of, of a, a broad form that a strategy could take, um, which you can see in the figure here. So the core elements of a strategy could be unified shared referral processes across agencies likely to encounter women who are homeless or, or at risk of homelessness. So something like a shared database with an information sharing GDPR compliant protocol in place that would underpin the network. Housing providers fundamentally should act as a part of this chain of referral points within a shared framework. There's evidence from other work that I've done that DAHA accreditation can be an effective part of preventing homelessness associated with domestic abuse. Um, a unified joint assessment system, so moving down um, with participation from social housing, housing support, um, health and mental health addiction, social work, social care services, criminal justice system, including probation, uh, domestic abuse services, and other agencies should be at the core of an effective strategy. Prevention, so prevention and rapid rehousing um, should not be seen as, as being, a, I suppose, a low support intervention. Sometimes women will only require low, level, require, sorry, low level support or just housing advice and assistance with retaining or rapidly accessing settled housing. Um, an effective preventative response will also integrate access to something like sanctuary, target hardening and offender management schemes and effectively access whatever support and treatment may be needed. Um, when homelessness has occurred, the available evidence base indicates that homelessness services for women, which have been built by and are run by women, are likely to be the more, the more effective services. There is a strong evidence base around Housing First, um, with some research also indicating that Housing First for Women, and Nicholas and I and other colleagues have been involved in some of that research, which is modified around issues that in include effective management of domestic abuse, can be a highly effective model. And broader evidence suggests that a housing-led integrated strategy that offers multiple forms of support, which can cross refer to one another is likely to be the most effective way. So we're looking at integrated packages of any required social care, social work, health access, mental health, addiction, and other support and treatment. And of course that helps to reduce um, uh, sorry, helps to prevent or, or end homelessness um, amongst women. Okay, so what are the broader lessons from the research? So, of course, as, as I said, and, and, and at least Lucy said at the beginning of, of, of the webinar, um, there are issues here that are, are specific to Camden. The reality is that most of these issues are exist across London and further afield across cities throughout the UK and these are ch shared challenges that we've been finding in women's homelessness research for a number of years now. So the broader lessons from the research which might be applicable to the wider UK, of course there's no reason to assume these patterns in women's homelessness that Nicholas um, outlined are unique to Camden. Women are present in the homeless population at much greater numbers than, in, than is generally assumed for the reasons that I outlined um, in the enumeration errors. Women are present in, uh, sorry, the assumption that women are, are unlikely to experience long-term and repeated homelessness is of course false as Nicholas illustrated. And women's homelessness inter intersects with domestic abuse in ways that are not, simply not the case for homeless men. And, and again, Lucy, Lucy talked about this at the beginning. And this, this really has to be recognized. And there are three points that, that stem from this. So service models like Housing First will require some modification if they are to properly recognize and respond to women's needs. Um, the evidence to date points to services designed, as I said, and, and run by women with, with um, coordination between domestic abuse and homelessness service, services being highly developed. And prevention of domestic abuse is integral to the effective prevention of, of women's homelessness services. And we know again, um, going back to, to something like DAHA accreditation that's been very successful in that, in terms of putting housing providers at, at the fore. An effective response to women's homelessness centers on ensuring recognition and that understanding and fundamentally being prepared to adapt strategy and having flexible systems where needed. Thank you.
Hi, uh, my name is Kate John. I'm the Women's Recovery Coordinator for Camden. Um, I'm just going to say do put your questions in the Q&A box if you've got any for the end for the researchers. Um, my role is to work across all the pathway hostels in Camden and also to engage with all the support agencies that might come into contact with homeless people and to support those organisations to think about how they work with women. And then um, Flick have really kindly asked me to come and share my reflections um, on this research and, and its findings in, in relation to Camden and our safe space work. Um, I think the biggest thing is that for most of us that talk about women's homelessness and work within women's homelessness a lot, that the findings are not necessarily new information. It's not shocking, but it's absolutely confirming what we have seen on the front line and what we hear anecdotally and what we've long suspected, but never really had the data to back up. And so it's so exciting to finally have a piece of research that actually tells us uh, you know what what we suspected in such a robust and solid way and that's really going to help move forward so many of the conversations around women's homelessness a few kind of key things struck me and i think they're going to repeat on the themes that other people have mentioned but i think that's okay because they come through so clearly for me for such a long time the homelessness sector has told us that women are such a small proportion of the clients we work with that that they are a niche or specialist subject that it's something a team can do if they have capacity or if there's additional funding and it's the reason why roles like mine exist but this research kind of refutes that it says it's, it's nearly a 50 50 problem we we can no longer see women's homelessness as a specialist subject we need to make the knowledge and understanding around how men and women's experience of homelessness differ a universal learning point for all services a minimum expectation that everyone understands that and that everyone comes up to speed regardless of whether you're a mixed gendered space or not and i think that that's that comes through really clearly and that's a really exciting way to start looking at the sector and how we can change um the second thing which definitely has come through so clearly is that intersectional nature between um, domestic abuse and, and women's homelessness. And I think everybody understands that so often uh, domestic abuse can result in a woman's homelessness and is the reason why she can become homeless. But it's, it's talked about much less is that that cycle of abuse continues and the perpetrator might change and the location might change and it, how it's viewed from the outside might change. But the cycle of abuse and that continuum of violence that a woman will experience is absolutely there and present and it comes through really clearly and having the research really focus our attention not only on that but also on the gap in provision and um, for those women is is really really important and the third big thing that really struck me is that although this is quite a bleak read and you don't particularly expect a piece of research on women's homelessness to be light uh, and upbeat it did feel quite heartwarming to be part of this process, but also to, to find to have the findings, uh, to be working in a borough that uh, wants to do this piece of work, that is progressive enough to ask these questions. And I, I absolutely believe that these findings would are reflective of what you'd find in any big borough um, across London and, and you know any big city across the country. But I think um, to have commissioners that want to ask these questions and really hear the answers, to have teams that have got a real appetite for change. And those days in the summer where we did the surveys and, and, and we got all, uh, all the agencies to come together to contribute towards this project, it really felt like there was a motivation to do something different, to find some answers. Um, and that was really exciting. And I think that's something we should be celebrating today. Um, and absolutely, this piece of research should be held up and celebrated but it's not just about celebrating it, it's about asking what we do next, because we can say this is great and we can put it in a drawer, but then it's lost. So we need to really think about what, what we can do, what we can take away from this, where is the learning, and almost see this research as a, as a call to arms to come together. It's, it's the start of a conversation of, of what we can do next. Um, and of course, that does need a huge systemic shift and it needs the acknowledgement that we're fundamentally working within an imbalanced society but we have to do something and, and we have to come together and, I, and it can feel overwhelming but I think it's important that we start this conversation today and um, Lucy and I have, have come together to look at some some ways that we could potentially do this and some kind of key asks that we might have for our borough and the services here, but also for people to take away and reflect on. The first one is relatively small. It's something that can be done for free in your service for 
no, no, not a huge amount of extra money or effort, but I think is really important and speaks to that point on thinking about a huge, the, the big systemic change and really thinking about what that looks like in a team in terms of culture change. I think it's also really important to recognize the context that those teams are currently working within. Over the last 18 months, we've seen teams like strip back through sickness and leave and um, high, high turnover of staff in, in frontline teams. And alongside that, within our safe space work, we've seen a, a huge rise in the level of need and vulnerability in the clients. And of course, those staff members have, have come in every day and met that need. But it's been impossible to ask teams to take on additional training or change practice or do something differently. Um, and I think it, it doesn't look like we're in a position where we are going to have like a reprieve in the pandemic or at a point where we can take stock. But so we need to continue to think about change and how we do that within our teams. And that might be looking at ways of rebuilding capacity and rebuilding resilience within your team, but also doing it in a way that thinks about maybe not doing more, but doing differently and thinking how we can better meet the needs of multiply disadvantaged women. Um, and Lucy's going to speak a little bit more about how we might do that. Yeah, thank you, Kate. Yeah, just a couple of um, kind of brief points to, to make on this. Um, I think sometimes um, working in this sector uh, as individuals or even in our teams and services, it can feel like um, when research comes out, uh, which is like this, uh, the recommendation is almost kind of too high level and too strategic for us to maybe engage with in a meaningful way um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And as Kate mentioned, obviously, there's loads of matters around resource as well. Um, but I think there's a couple of things which we can do um, as a takeaway from this research, um, you know, starting from now within our services. So firstly, just just speaking to the women who access our services about how they experience that service. Um, you know, unless you're working for a, a women's specialist service that's been designed and run by women for women, uh, the chances are that your processes and your policies um, and the physical space of your building, if you operate out of a building, will not have been designed uh, with women in mind, because as we've heard a number of times today, um, especially in the homelessness sector, um, things have been male dominated for a really, really long time. So just starting to um, work in our teams and discuss in our teams and with the women that are accessing our services, you know, how does it feel for a woman to access that service? You know, what's the assessment like for her? What's the support planning process like for her? Could we do anything to kind of think about the physical space that she's occupying and just start to take really, really small steps towards making the work that we do within our services more gender informed uh, with direct kind of consultation from the women they're accessing. Um, Kate's mentioned her safe space approach, um, which has been rolled out across Camden. Um, there are lots and lots of resources as part of that safe space approach, which you'd be really willing to share. So do reach out if you'd like to hear more about the safe space approach. And again, it's not asking um, individual staff members or, or teams to take on loads and loads of additional work. It's about kind of changing what we have and what we're doing already uh, with reference to kind of the needs of the women that are using our services. So kind of on the theme of reaching out as well, um, something which again, we've heard throughout the event today is about this link between um, the homelessness sector and the domestic abuse sector and the need for not working just to be joined up, but to be really kind of, um, you know, responding to people's needs, to women's needs um, together, you know, not signposting them off to two different teams, but responding to their needs as they are. Um, and it may be that in your role, uh, you do not have a kind of, you know, the power to make, you know, massive strategic change in how those two sectors work together. But we, what we can do um, is always make local partnerships. So making sure that we're really well integrated with our local domestic abuse specialist service, you know, inviting them to team meetings and going to theirs, building capacity, kind of sharing knowledge about this client group, um, asking questions, inquiring, discussing cases, um, even look at looking at um, the possibility of co-location, which can be a really brilliant um, and free learning resource with both teams. Um, starting to kind of really form those strong partnerships um, in your local areas is something that we can do today and which can only kind of improve our, our practice and our response. Um, I'm just going to hand back to Kate now. Thanks. So our second ask does really focus in on, on Camden and thinking about that link between the domestic abuse or, or VORG more broadly and homelessness um, and the gap in provision that's, that, that is there for us here in Camden and I think is probably a much more widespread issue. Um, I think it's really important to say that it's not about pointing fingers and say that there's a particular service that's not doing their job or that is, is not meeting the needs of those women. It's simply that there is not a service that's commissioned on a big enough scale to do that. 
And I say on a big enough scale because there is a service in our borough that is doing an exceptional job of meeting the needs of multiply disadvantaged women and does it incredibly effectively, but it's just funded in such a small way. They only have the capacity to meet with two or three women across a couple of boroughs. And so it's, it's really hard for them to, to anywhere. It's a drop in the ocean. Um, and that service is wiser. Uh, I'm not sure if people are familiar with their service, but they work on a kind of quite simple principle based on three things. And we've actually thought it's so good that we've stolen it within Safe Space and replicated it within our Safe Space psychotherapy service. And again, we've seen a huge success with that model. And it's really based around three simple things. It's taking a specialist worker. So whether that's an IDSVA or IDVA or in our case, a psychotherapist, it's embedding that worker within a, a team that really understands multiple disadvantage and homelessness. And then giving that specialist worker an assertive outreach approach to really meet the needs of multiply disadvantaged clients in that moment, both physically and emotionally. And the success has been incredible of both services. And so I really want to see today as a sort of jumping off point for seeing why we cannot replicate that on a bigger scale, because this report tells us that the need is absolutely there. The level of violence is there. The women are there. So why are we not meeting it? And one of the answers to that is probably that for so long we have looked to one or the other service to solve that problem rather than seeing it as a shared problem and a shared responsibility between the women's sector or the VORG sector and the homelessness. And so we need to come together and think about joint commissioning. And, and as Joe said, that's very clearly one of the findings from the research as well. Um, so, yeah, we would like to see today and, and going forward, Lucy and I will be pursuing ways that we can look at uh, bringing those two sectors together to, to join up that thinking and replicating something like the WISER project across the borough. And I'll pass that to Lucy for the third ask. Thank you, Kate. Um, so our third ask um, is to leaders and decision makers um, across London and nationally as well. So we know that the average age of death for a woman who's homeless is 43 years old, um, and that's compared to the age of 80 years old for a woman in the general population. So thinking about those statistics, um, homelessness can be seen to almost half a woman's life expectancy, which I think is really um, shocking. Um, We've heard today about how and why uh, women's homelessness has been misunderstood or underrepresented. Um, and we've also heard from the report from the University of York uh, that women are great uh, are in the homelessness population in much greater numbers um, than we've thought previously. And it's likely to be more um, of a 50 50 percent split uh, rather than that 15 percent, which is visible um, on our streets. And I think those those statistics kind of really, really speak for themselves. Um, so I started off um, this event by talking about the fact that we've situated this launch um, within the 16 days of activism against gender based violence this year. Um, and as Kate's mentioned as well, we, we really do see this report um, as a call for action. Um, so we would like to ask our leaders and our decision makers uh, that this report is used to really respond to women's homelessness um, in a strategic way, um, both at a local authority and a national level. Um, we'd like to ask for designated strategies which are really grounded in an understanding of women's homelessness and how that looks different from men's and um, how it should be counted differently and responded to differently and also women to be offered um, truly gender informed solutions which will enable them to kind of leave this revolving door of homelessness between streets, sofa surfing, hidden homelessness um, and the hostels um, and move away from homelessness permanently um, and also to live lives which are free from violence and abuse which um, as we've heard again many times today is a near universal experience for women experiencing homelessness. Um, so I think really that is a key message to end on today. Um, women's strategy is, is not an afterthought. Um, it's, it's essential really if we are to effectively respond uh, to women's experiences of homelessness. Okay, thank you. Um, we're now going to invite all our panelists back to join us for um, questions just for 10 to 15 minutes at the end. So if you do have any questions, um, I can see that the, the Q&A box is filling up already, but do pop them in now and um, we'll try to get through as many as we can. So let's just take a look. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Okay. So, uh, the first question is, how do we capture women who are currently homeless but not accessing any services or accessing services that are unrelated to homelessness? Um, so, is there anyone who'd like to start off on that question? 
I'm, I'm happy to actually start that off. So I think I think that's a that's a great question, actually. So, you know, if we're not finding women in our systems currently, you know, how do we go about doing that? I think one of the key learnings um, from our project in Flick across Camden and Islington um, is being really, really flexible with that referral policy, because what we do find is even if women aren't accessing homelessness services, they will, due to their kind of other needs and other disadvantages, be popping up elsewhere in the system. So even if they're, you know, fleetingly accessing a substance use service to get a script or maybe they're, um, you know, being arrested for repeat offences and the police are aware that they're vulnerable, they will be popping up in these different parts of the system. So what we need to do is form those networks, uh, make those connections and not have these kind of really kind of difficult referral criteria and pathways which exclude women who are not coming through those kind of traditional homelessness pathways. Um, and also I think we need to allow women to self-refer, we need to uh, speak to women about where they are sleeping, what their experience of homelessness is, and not, you know, not have that designated by a kind of outward source, uh, meet women where they are. Um, and also someone, one of the women who spoke in our video said it so well, uh, if we want to find these women, we've got to do something about it in the daytime. You know, we know that the vast proportion of women will be hidden away at night. I think, you know, it's, it's a very, very sensible thing that women are doing to not, to, to not be visible on the streets at night. So we need to respond to that in the day. We need to make sure that we are doing outreach, we're making services accessible, and we're talking to women about their experience of homelessness and bringing them into support in the daytime. I don't know whether anyone else would like to add on to that. Nope. Oh, yeah, Nicholas. Very quickly, there's a major problem with a lack of integration between domestic abuse and homelessness data. So this is a UK and pan-European problem. So whether or not you're counted as homeless depends which system you have contact with quite often. So we don't really register, and this is one of the problems with the administration of data, we don't really register how many women going into domestic abuse services are actually homeless. Um, because those two systems are uh, the data in those two systems is separated. It's a I think that's a major issue around the need to better integration of domestic abuse and homelessness service data, and it goes to kind of wider point about the need for greater integration around those services. Thanks, Nicholas. Um, so the next question is. Do other countries um, count and or respond to women's homelessness differently? Um, and are there any lessons that we could take from them? Um, Nicholas or Joe, I think that's one, one for you. I think Nicholas would be best place for the Finnish work possibly. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, great. There are different ways of, of counting it. So Nordic countries are much better and pay much more attention to hidden homeless, to homelessness, to concealed homelessness. And that means they're better at understanding women's experience and the dimensions of that. So it's not something we really attempt to count here, but other countries do attempt to count it and do attempt to understand it better. And as soon as you kind of broaden the definition of homelessness away from people in contact with services and or on the street, women start to appear in much, much greater numbers because that's the pattern, you know, that's the trajectory that they take through homelessness because um, there aren't the services available. Um, it feels like that's probably the safest option when there aren't the services available. So yes, there's better ways of, of thinking about it and, and looking at it. I mean, it's just worth flagging. Um, I'll stick it in the chat, but um, the uh, evidence review that that Joe's just done for Fiensa, which looks at kind of um, pan-European experience around women's homelessness and how different systems respond to it. Great, thank you, Nicholas. Um, so the next question is, how can we best support women in mixed gender services? And is it even possible for mixed gender service to be gender informed? Um, Kate, would you be happy to answer that one? Sure. Um, so we've done some of our own research within Safe Space and we have been told really clearly from women um, what they want. And it, it does range. Um, and most of all, they want choice and they want choice and control of their space. Um, and so there are some key things that you can do to bring that in. And obviously, for some women, that does absolutely mean a single sex environment and um, absolutely women only hostels and spaces should be created and, and be an option for, for, for any woman experiencing homelessness. But there are things that, that mixed gendered spaces can do. Um, I think fundamentally acknowledging that uh, most women will find a mixed gendered space male dominated. And so thinking about how the layout of your space and how that is experienced by your clients is really key. 
Um, and then things like tailoring your how women uh, come into your service. So women told us that their um, their first contact with the service made a really big diff impact on how they viewed and trusted that service. So really rigorous uh, questionnaires or assessments or interviews and referral processes really stopped women from engaging and trusting that service. So as Lucy was saying, kind of almost getting women to, to run through and do a walkthrough of your service to understand how they will experience it made a big difference. So if you can eliminate that sort of like um, interrogation at the first point of contact, it has a really big um, impact on how women trust you. Also, viewing physical safety and emotional safety uh, kind of equally. I think a lot of women find that we've really focused heavily on their physical safety and so how much they're using or where their perpetrator is, but we don't necessarily use language that respects them or offers them choice or control or we just share that how we share their information or how we talk about them in spaces so things like that um kind of offer back more kind of autonomy and control to a woman rather than just being totally obsessed with their physical safety valuing that emotional safety as well and then thing case conferencing tools like team around me which has been piloted by flick is absolutely fantastic way of honoring the woman and holding her voice and keeping that at center and being very trauma informed and understanding that trauma. And I think that's absolutely key to making women feel seen and heard throughout their recovery, regardless of where she's living as well. Brilliant, thanks very much, Kate. Um, someone has asked, were transgender women um, included in this research? Um, yes, they were. So when we talk about women um, for the purposes of this research, we're talking about anyone who identifies as a woman. So thank you for that. Um, some doubt is if current street outreach isn't an effective way of finding women, what would a good system look like? Anyone want to respond to that? So I think um, Joe covered that quite well in the kind of the, the map of what an integrated strategy could look like. So again, kind of going back to that idea of you know cross sector pathways. Uh, rather than just relying on, you know, homelessness provision to bring women into support. Um, I think that kind of answers that point really well. Um, let's look through the questions. So does the Domestic Abuse Act have a greater role to play in meeting women experiencing homelessness and Borg at the intersection of their inequalities? Does anyone want to speak about the Domestic Abuse Act? Um, I could, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't have too much to say about that, but because um, of course it's still relatively early, but I think the changes in terminology and the emphasis on priority needs obviously mean that in practical terms, these changes will inevitably broaden the circumstances in which um, local authorities obviously will be required to accept homelessness applications. Um, it's too early to say, I think, what the overall impact may be, but it's definitely something that we'll be watching closely. I think what it does do is it, it emphasizes or it places further emphasis on the need for housing providers to be a fundamental part of the response to domestic abuse. Um, and again, I've, I've already mentioned, but the work that we did with Daha over the last few years illustrated the, the key role that, that providers can play in, in prevention. So I think, you know, over the next year or so, I think we'll see sort of the the more um specific sort of impacts of of the act and the changes that they've made yeah thank you and i think it'll be interesting to see how that translates to our frontline practice as, as with everything else um i think we're gonna have one more question now and then we're gonna finish for today and um, there's lots of questions that we haven't had time to answer uh, but we will be sending a follow-up email with a link to the report itself um so we'll endeavor to answer all of these questions in that email as well so thank you for all of these um, just a final question. Um, so this is one for Joanne and Nicholas. Someone would like to ask you, um, it's quite a big question. So what do you think are the greatest barriers to achieving the recommendations you detailed at the end of your report or your presentation? Money um, is obviously, I mean, resource issues is, is a huge constraint. Um, and I think there's a danger with, with this kind of with this kind of work and any kind of evaluative research where you kind of look for a scapegoat or somebody to blame. But often it is about resource allocation. It is often about money. Um, one of the, the, the biggest challenges is, is what Lucy you already mentioned in, in reference to a question a couple of uh, a couple of questions ago is is the, the challenge in, in, in agencies working together and having those shared systems in place. I think they're fundamental. Um, Nicholas, do you have anything anything more? 
I think recognition. I mean, the, the kind of predominant image of homelessness as a problem of lone white middle-aged men with addiction and severe mental illness, which is you know, completely false, really. The homelessness is highly gendered, but if you look at who experiences it, if you look at, you know, we call it family homelessness, and you look at how many, you know, 70 odd thousand um, households in temporary accommodation in London, we call it family homelessness, but the, almost all of those are lone women parents with children, and very often the trigger for their homelessness has been abuse. And you look at the experience of, of these women and, and, um, you know, services aren't there in part because there's just an assumption that that population doesn't exist. Um, so, you know, they're, they're made doubly invisible by the fact that, you know, there's an assumption they're not there. So, you know, you don't provide anything. So, you, you know, that means you, you, you can't see them. And so I think there's, you know, I mean, I, um, Particularly the work that, that that Joe's done and that some other people have done and that um, Fiance that I work with is starting to do that other agencies are starting to do is vital to draw attention to this. It's the kind of huge gap in our response to homelessness strategically. I mean, there's huge problems with all of our responses to homelessness, but this is the area that has received least attention. So I think it's it's. Yeah, recognition is would be the thing, and and, and understanding that this problem is real and out there, um, where there's that's still not really properly been internalised by government. I don't think. Thank you, Nicholas, and yeah, hopefully this uh, re research and report will go some way to um, making that recognition uh, more widespread. Um, that's all we've got time for today. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you so much to our panellists. Um, and as I said, we'll be following up this event uh, with an email, uh, giving you a link to the report um, and answering any outstanding questions as well. So thank you very much for joining us. <laughs>